episode 672. Book talk begins at 20 minutes and 36 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 672 Ball Has Fallen. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by listeners like you, patrons and channel members like Tammy, Jeremy Wayne, Jill Carrick, Linda Choder, and Jessa June. And this week, a big thank you to our two new patrons, Pixie Bits, how cool is that, and Susan Martinez. Your name is lovely too. It's been a week. I'm kind of, actually, I'm honestly kind of in shock right now because even though it still takes me four days to prep for uh, recording a podcast, I know I look, especially for watching the video, I look kind of like I'm together and I'm okay. And I'm not. It's the theater training, partly. It's also, there's only one day a week that I can get out of bed and put myself together even sort of like this and this is it and then I pay for it for the rest of the week so you know you try and be positive about things but then what happens is you get denied a second time for disability and my brain isn't any better and my body is barely any better so it is rough today but be that as it may hi new listeners you don't need to know this welcome to Craftlet. We are on Emma. We have just passed the climax, the drama climax of the book. And now we are in the uh, the denouement, the part where all of the knots that have been tied get untied and we get to some resolution in the book. Uh, if you are new, we start the whole book in episode 649. So you're welcome to go back and start there. And other pieces of newsy bits. The rafflecopter widget was not in the show notes last week. Uh, right away, I think, I think I fixed it and it should be there now. But this is the problem with not having sidebars anymore on blogs, Heather says, snittily. <laughs> this month, the book that we are raffling off is Continuous Cables. It is gorgeous. It has some lovely, I just opened the same picture as on the cover. It has some lovely cabled patterns. Isn't that pretty? And it's by Melissa Liepman. It's been around for a while. Like I said, I am in the process of destashing and some of the really nice hardcover books that I pretty much didn't use, I am giving them away so they can go to a different home and find some love there. So if you're interested, follow the link in the show notes and you can get yourself a copy, maybe you can win yourself a copy of Continuous Cables. If you've never done cable knitting before, I really, really, really highly recommend that A, you take advantage of YouTube because it's so much easy to learn this now. You can watch the videos, uh, the video instructions over and over and over and over and no one gets annoyed with you. So that's always a plus. But really there are some, some very good ones. I highly recommend when you see tutorials that you just keep looking for ones that are done with light colored yarn and kind of chunky, heavier, non-splitty yarn. I don't always find manicures to be a deal breaker one way or the other. I know some people really do, but I figure if you're a knitter, you're paying attention to your strings and your needles and you really just don't need to go get your nails done. So I, I don't I don't give take points off for non-manicured demonstrations like that. But cables are actually considerably easier than I ever thought they were going to be. And another 
cable tip. I know you can buy cable needles that are hooks that are usually the ones that I've seen are plastic. Those are fine. They work fine. But I'll be honest, I still have a Brittany Birch cable needle that is just, it's almost like if you took a Q-tip and you flattened the ends. So you'd kind of have rounded ends and a thinner, flatter middle part. That's what this cable needle is like. It's so simple. You will look at it and say, Heather, all of my needles are going to slide right off of this. And you would be wrong, especially if you're working with wool. I cannot say anything about using that Brittany Birch cable needle with something like bamboo. But even with, with silk, sil still, silk gets sticky. Silk yarn gets sticky. So I, I think you'd be safe with everything except for maybe bamboo and some really, really slick microfibers and things like that. So if you've been thinking about it, but you're not sure, go ahead and put your name in the running and see if you get the book. And then go get a cable needle. Although you don't even need to get a cable needle. You can totally do this with just a double-pointed needle. Just get one, you know, like a size bigger than your regular needles and it won't slide out and it'll be fine. All right, that's my my two cents on cable knitting for, for the week. So as you might imagine, with disability not coming through for me again, I have started over the last month, I've been slowly trying to kind of claw my way back together online and make sure that buttons are working and things so that donations can come in are working. So we now have on the link tree, that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash craftlet channel. You can now find links to a way to donate to craftlet via Venmo. And there's PayPal me and, uh, and all of those links are also on my heatherordover.com site. This is where I'm trying to resurrect the whole concept of blog rolls and things like that. Because again, it's just super annoying. I can't find a way to share good things that I find easily. And the the Craftlet blog, I really don't want to muddy the waters at craftlet.com because that is where the episodes are and organized. And it's a structural nightmare anyway because this podcast has gone on so much longer than usual podcasts. So yeah, heatherordover.com. You'll be able to find everything there as well as at the Linktree site. Along with that, we are going to be over on the Craftlet site resurrecting the old memberships process. And that is because we have finally come to terms with the fact that it is the only way that we can get gifted audio memberships to work. This will mean that you could gift somebody a Jane Eyre tier or a Mina tier or a Walter Hartwright tier or a Marion Halcom tier if you really want to. We're going to keep the same tier names that we have over at Patreon the same way that we are on YouTube channel memberships, but this will give you an opportunity to, like I said, gift somebody else access to the Discord and all the audio and all of those things. But also, it will give us a location where you can come to support the show without us losing two-thirds of what you are sending us to the platforms. I'm kind of not exaggerating. For the app, anybody who is using the app, it's very convenient. It's the way I listen to the premium audio when it comes out. But it is also a third of your fee goes to Apple and a third goes to Libsyn, and then we get the last third. Patreon's a little bit better, but not not all that much. There are always going to be fees taken out for things like PayPal and Venmo. That's how they make it possible for us to utilize their credit card abilities. Eric has been working on this behind the scenes, actually, with the lovely support staff over at the Daily Beans, and they found one solution for the this problem of not being able to gift people Patreon memberships. But we already had that membership platform at one time over on the Craftlet site. So we're we are working on on resurrecting that for you. By the time this episode goes live, the membership option will be live on Craftlet.com. And I think it's honest to God, Craftlet.com slash memberships. 
We will show you the link on the screen on YouTube and it will be in the show notes no matter what. But it's going to take a minute for us to make sure that all of the audio is back and available on the craftlet.com memberships pages. Because I, I don't think I deleted the original membership pages that had the books on them, but when we restructured the site, a lot of stuff got lost and I've only started digging into it. So whatever you do, when you go to craftlet.com slash memberships, you will be able to see a note to you explaining what the situation is and and where we are with a, an ETA for when everything's going to be uploaded. On that note, Eric has finished uploading onto the YouTube channel membership, uh, Dorian Gray, Room with a View, and now I think Canterbury Tales also. So we're we're closing in on having all of the previous Craftlet premium audio onto uh, YouTube as well. I think Eric's been very strategic in how and what he's been uploading, which I really appreciate because I know some of the uploads are in responses to requests from listeners. So thank you, Eric. Speaking of things like premiums and bonuses and stuff, don't forget if you are at the Mina Harker level on uh, the Patreon tier or the commensurate level on YouTube memberships or on the channel memberships, uh, you will be able to come to the watch party. And this month, September 26th, we're going to be watching the Indian Bollywood film from 2010 called Aisha, which is an Emma update. Which I'm very excited about. And talking about Aisha and things like that, it reminded me that last night we got a message that popped up on uh, YouTube comments. I really, it is, we're getting, we're back to getting more comments. And I think YouTube does, in fact, make that whole process easier. So yay for that. But Anne Finari 5068 sent a, a comment that I really was intrigued by. And so then I talked to Andrew about it and I will read you both her comment and our response and then let y'all have at it because I am sure you are going to think of other things as well. So first, the comment from Anne. So Anne says, Heather, I rewatched Clueless yesterday and then was discussing it with my husband, talking to him about how the novel translated so well to a modern setting. I watched other, less good, but still workable, modern adaptations of other Austin novels and read most of the Austin Project novels. My husband is a big Dickens fan, but we couldn't think of any Dickens novels which has been similarly updated. I maintain this is because Dickens was commenting at very much on a specific time in society and secondarily was conveying universal truths about human nature, while Austin used smaller, narrower slices of society, which served her larger universal truths about people and how they were confined or defined by the societies that they lived in. I simplified it to make my point, but I do think I am at least somewhat correct. I wondered if you knew of any updating of Dickens' works, and if you had any thoughts about why there aren't any, if that's true. And I thought, oh, Anne, you're onto something very interesting here. So what I wrote back was, I think you're onto something. <laughs> no, really. And I wrote, uh, Andrew didn't see the 1998 Great Expectations, the modernization with Ethan Hawke and Gwyneth Paltrow, but he loves Bill Murray's Scrooged from 1988, and he adored Barbara Kingsolver's Demon Copperhead, which all supports my thoughts and I think yours. I think the differences between 1820 society's interpersonal needs and foibles and our current interpersonal needs and foibles haven't changed much. But once you hit the big business mills like in North and South and the Oliver Bleak House style social stratification because of industrialization and factories, that changes everything. And that doesn't really start to hit literature until... 1850, 1860. So we still had, in Jane Austen's time, quite a ways to go before we were going to get here. Somehow the agrarian lives of the early 1800s are allowed to be just lives for us, I guess. And we aren't very different now from then when it comes to personality types, which I think we can all agree, having read through this much of Emma. 
But I do think that we're not quite yet able to recognize, for example, the privatized prison system as a version of modern day workhouses, nor have reports of children working nights and being injured at chicken plants really hit the mainstream recognition as a modern horror of industrial child labor yet. Give a few years on this same path, though, and I think we will see more books and or movies like Demon Copperhead. I'm not thrilled about that, but I do recommend Barbara's book. And then I wrote, it also makes me wonder about literature coming out of the countries where our factories have been moved. I can easily see a Dickensian-like take on that in the, the fast fashion industry and other overseas factories. So I'm going to keep my eyes open for that now. Thank you. I am fairly certain, knowing many of you, that you have already started exploding with thoughts and ideas. So if you need to pause, <laughs> go write yourself some notes. Please do. And if you want to share them with the podcast, you can send a voicemail to area code 206 350-1642. You can email heather at craftlit.com and we will read your email on the episode. Or you can, you know, if you're on YouTube, you can comment. You can even go to 671 and comment on the thread that we started and keep that sucker rolling. And I, I will tell you, because I'm an utter nerd, I did take a screenshot of Anne's question and my response. And I, I did send it to Barbara King Solver. I haven't checked my Instagram messages yet, but I knew it would give her enormous pleasure to uh, see this question asked about Dickensian updating in uh, in such a good way. And maybe we will find out that there's probably going to be a movie version of a Barbara King Solver book, and maybe it's going to be Demon Copperhead. I am not predicting. I am just hoping, because I think it would be really cool. And yes, David Copperfield and Demon Copperhead as a thing are something I've been trying to figure out with my adult brain. It has not gone quickly, but I am, it will be in our future at some point, is all I'm saying. So that's one. Then we also got an email from listener Stephanie, who is Crooked Knits on Ravelry. I'm listening to the most recent episode where you're talking about strawberry varieties. I don't know anything about these either, but The Illusionist did a whole episode on the naming of apple varieties as well as how new ones are developed. It was a couple of years ago. She gave us a link, which is, I know you'll be shocked, theillusionist.org slash illusionist slash apples. And we will put the spelling of that on the screen because illusionist is not I-L, it's A-L, A-L-L-U. S I O N I S T illusionist. In case you hadn't seen slash heard of that podcast show, it's lovely. Then she goes on and says, It looks like there was another Apple episode last year, but I fell behind on this podcast and I haven't gotten to that one yet. I just figured I'd share since it's the typical quirky thing that cra other Craftlet listeners would probably enjoy. And I thought, Stephanie you know our people. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I have not listened to it yet, but it is queued up on my my podcast app and I am planning on it, especially since it's kind of apple-y season-y here. And, uh, uh, and I am itching to make some of that apple chili jam thing, like kind of like a chutney that Brenda Dane shared the recipe for. Oh, I don't know. 19 years ago, maybe. I still have it somewhere. I know I printed it out. I will find it and I will share it. It's so good. Oh my God. And I don't like spicy, but I, I will do jalapeno jelly happily with cream cheese preferred. But I also really liked chili apple jelly. You know, my mom is going to be here soon. <gasps> she's coming to visit. Maybe we'll have time to make some and rebuild the basement. I'll be talking to my mom. Anyway, we also got a comment from Mo3212-P10 over on YouTube. And, and this is if if you could see me right now, I am a big faceplant emoji. 
Mo writes, Madeira wine is from the Portuguese island of Madeira. It is not from Spain. And I'm going to not take the low road and blame the annotations because I think I should have known that. I think I used to know that. And I'm hugely embarrassed. So apologies to Portugal. You guys never get the credit you deserve. And even for me, I blew it for you. So Madeira wine is from the Portuguese island of Madeira, a place that I'm sure would be lovely to go. <sighs> All right. Volume three, chapter eight, or chapter 44 of Emma. Last week, Box Hill, brutal, hard. Now, as I said at the, the beginning of, of the episode, we are in Denouement country. We are in the unraveling of all the knots that have been tied, of which there have been many. But most of the knots in today's episode are tied up inside Emma, but also inside another character. And I did receive another email. I got it last night, and I'm very, very excited to read it to you because it's a completely more nuanced take on some of the Frank Churchill, Jane Fairfax story than what I provided you with uh, in the previous two weeks. So I'm going to read that email from Julie at the end of today's chapters because I think it's going to make more sense, especially if you've never read the book before. I think it's going to make more sense after today. Now that we're in the home stretch of this book, there is not a lot that goes on. It, the same thing happened with Three Musketeers. I feel like I am needed, Craftlet is needed, for the work to get towards the climax. But once you hit the climax, a lot of the groundwork has been laid for the language that gets used or the topics that gets covered that get covered. And it's a, a much easier lift on my end. I'm going to start combining chapters again. I had originally charted everything out on a day when my brain was not working, and we thought it was going to take until mid-November to finish the book. I think I am going to be able to get to it more quickly than that. So there will be a, an updated calendar coming out where you can expect things. But we're also putting a calendar out so that you can prepare for doing a uh, joining us for the post-Emma live stream. That way you'll have time to finish listening to the book if you've been hoarding chapters, and why wouldn't you? And you can also plan to join us for the, the live stream. I'm very excited about the end of book live stream. I've also created a form on Google Forms. If you have comments about the book that you want to share on that live stream, you can send us a voicemail. You can record something on your own and upload it via the Google form. Or you can record a video on your phone, like a TikTok video or whatever, and upload that file to us that way. And that way we can actually share you talking about the book with everybody else. And then we'll have a, a chance for everybody in the, the chat and all of us on screen to commentate and conversate about the points you make. This is all a long way of saying this chapter, there's not a whole lot that you need me for at the beginning, but there's a lot of implications in this chapter that I did not catch my first couple of times through. So I'm looking forward to that on the flip side. So there is a moment where it kind of feels like Jane Austen dropped a thread. We know there's uh, Mrs. Bragg and Mrs. Suckling. Those are friends of Mrs. Elton's from Maple Grove. Ah, uh, Maple Grove. And, and we also know that they didn't need governesses. But they had a friend who did. And so there's going to be a reference to Mrs. Suckling's situation. And that is not the post at her house. That is the situation she can connect Mrs. Elton to on behalf of Jane Fairfax. So if you hear that and you're thinking, wait a minute, she, she didn't need a governess, you are correct. That's also not what Jane Austen means. It's such a brief 
I don't know if it happens to you, it happens to me. I'll hear something and, you know, the book will keep talking at me. And then a few lines later, I'm like, wait a minute, something was wrong. It's kind of like if you, if you happen to see something violent on the street, it takes a minute for your brain to go, wait, that, that was not supposed to happen. That's, I'm backing up and making sure that the people are okay. Nobody was harmed. It, well, actually, <laughs> I'm not going to go out and say that yet. We have to talk about this chapter afterwards. Uh, Miss Spates is going to use the word fagged. We have heard this before. It is not a slur. It's just the way people talked about being tired out at this time. I know I still have friends in the UK who talk about being fagged. So not the same thing, not a slur, just a manner of speech. Everybody's got them. Don't forget how little, how very, very little women who were governesses would make. And if they were in a really bad situation, their room and board would be deducted from their already minimal pay. So you're going to hear a reference to a large salary for a governess position. And you're going to hear it from Miss Bates. And I just want you to keep in mind how very, very poor Miss Bates is comparatively to everyone else in the book. And that for her, it wouldn't take much for her to think, oh, that's amazing. It would be like somebody thinking that $10 an hour was an amazing minimum wage if they never actually had to try and live on $10 an hour. It's just, it's not possible. There are so few places in this country that are left where you could even afford rent, much less food or anything else, if all you were making was $10 an hour. And we know that. This is one of those places where you have to remember who's talking. You will hear a reference to rheumatic gout. I had never heard this before. And it turns out I had never heard this before because it actually isn't a thing. So there is rheumatism, there is gout. They both hurt. They are caused by different things. And even at this time, they were known to have been caused by different things and not be related. In fact, one, one writer in 1827 said, it is certain that rheumatic gout is a malady whose symptoms cannot be clearly described. Because there, it's too bro- too many different factors come into play. It's kind of like long COVID, that so many things can go wrong. But it is a, a term that non-medical professionals could use to describe anything that is swollen and painful and kind of constant. And that that, that would be incorrect. It's actually just badly inflamed rheumatism. There's a phrase to getting relief from the parish. This is relief like welfare or unemployment. This is is getting financial help from the parish. The person who would be in charge of distributing that support would be Mr. Elton. And an ostler, there's an ostler at the Crown, the Crown being the local inn, Ostlers we've come across in lots of craftlet books. These are the guys who keep the stables at the inn. They they groom the horses, they care for the horses, and uh, and they they run the whole stable part of the situation. So it's a, a respected position. It's a necessary position, and a good ostler would be really really good to have if you were an inn that frequently had people traveling through town which our little town clearly does and clearly used to have more of because as we know, the economy there has kind of shrunk and it's, it's not quite the, the happening joint that it had been when Emma's mom was alive. And that is it. All right, let's listen to chapter 44 or volume three, chapter eight of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version of the book, please fast wind too. 43 minutes and 37 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume 3, Chapter 8 The wretchedness of a scheme to box Hale was in Emma's thoughts all the evening. 
How it might be considered by the rest of the party she could not tell. They, in their different homes and their different ways, might be looking back on it with pleasure, but in her view it was a morning more completely misspent, more totally bare of rational satisfaction at the time, and more to be abhorred in recollection, than any she had ever passed. A whole evening of backgammon with her father was felicity to it. There, indeed, lay real pleasure, for there she was giving up the sweetest hours of the twenty-four to his comfort, and feeling that, unmerited as might be the degree of his fond affection and confiding esteem, she could not, in her general conduct, be open to any severe reproach. As a daughter, she hoped she was not without a heart. She hoped no one could have said to her, "'How could you be so unfeeling to your father? I must, I will tell you truths while I can.' Miss Bates should never again. No, never. If attention in future could do away the past, she might hope to be forgiven. She had been often remiss, her conscience told her so, remiss, perhaps, more in thought than in fact, scornful, ungracious. But it should be so no more. In the warmth of true contrition, she would call upon her the very next morning, and it should be the beginning, on her side, of a regular, equal, kindly intercourse. She was just as determined when the morrow came, and went early, that nothing might prevent her. It was not unlikely, she thought, that she might see Mr. Knightley in her way, or perhaps he might come in while she were paying her visit. She had no objection. She would not be ashamed of the appearance of the penitence, so justly and truly hers. Her eyes were towards Donwell as she walked, but she saw him not. The ladies were all at home. She had never rejoiced at the sound before, nor ever before entered the passage, nor walked up the stairs, with any wish of giving pleasure, but in conferring obligation, or of deriving it except in subsequent ridicule. There was a bustle on her approach, a good deal of moving and talking. She heard Miss Bates's voice, something was to be done in a hurry, the maid looked frightened and awkward, hoped she would be pleased to wait a moment, and then ushered her in too soon. The aunt and niece seemed both escaping into the adjoining room. Jane she had a distinct glimpse of, looking extremely ill, and before the door had shut them out she heard Miss Bates saying, "'Well, my dear, I shall say you are laid down upon the bed, and I am sure you are ill enough.' Poor old Mrs. Bates, civil and humble as usual, looked as if she did not quite understand what was going on. "'I am afraid Jane is not very well,' said she. "'But I do not know. They tell me she is well.' I dare say my daughter will be here presently, Miss Woodhouse. I hope you find a chair. I wish Hetty had not gone. I am very little able. Have you a chair, ma'am? Do you sit where you like? I am sure she will be here presently. Emma seriously hoped she would. She had a moment's fear of Miss Bates keeping away from her. But Miss Bates came soon. Very happy and obliged. But Emma's conscience told her that there was not the same cheerful volubility as before, less ease of look and manner. A very friendly inquiry after Miss Fairfax, she hoped, might lead the way to a return of old feelings. The touch seemed immediate. "'Ah, Miss Woodhouse, how kind you are! I suppose you have heard, and are come to give us joy. This does not seem much like joy, indeed, in me,' twinkling away a tear or two but it will be very trying for us to part with her, after having had her so long, and she has a dreadful headache just now, writing all the morning, such long letters, you know, to be written to Colonel Campbell and Mrs. Dixon. My dear, said I, you will blind yourself, for tears were in her eyes perpetually. One cannot wonder, one cannot wonder. It is a great change, and though she is amazingly fortunate, such a situation, I suppose, as no young woman has ever before met with on first going out. Do not think us ungrateful, Miss Woodhouse, for such surprising good fortune." again dispersing her tears. But, poor dear soul, if you were to see what a headache she has, when one is in great pain you know one cannot feel any blessing quite as it may deserve. She is as low as possible. To look at her nobody would think how delighted and happy she is to have secured such a situation. You will excuse her not coming to you. She is not able. She has gone into her own room. I want her to lie down upon the bed. My dear, said I, I shall say you are laid down upon the bed. But, however, she is not. She is walking about the room. But now that she has written her letters, she says she shall soon be well. She will be extremely sorry to miss seeing you, Miss Woodhouse, but your kindness will excuse her. You were kept waiting at the door. I was quite ashamed, but somehow there was a little bustle, for it so happened that we had not heard the knock, and till you were on the stairs we did not know anybody was coming. It is only Mrs. Cole, said I, depend upon it. Nobody else had come so early. Well, said she, it must be born some time or other, and it may as well be now. But then Patty came in and said it was you. Oh, said I, it is Miss Woodhouse. I am sure you will like to see her. 
"'I can see nobody,' said she, and up she got and would go away, and that was what made us keep you waiting, and extremely sorry and ashamed we were. "'If you must go, my dear,' said I, "'you must, and I will say you are laid down upon the bed.' Emma was most sincerely interested. Her heart had been long growing kinder towards Jane, and this picture of her present sufferings acted as a cure of every former ungenerous suspicion, and left her nothing but pity, and the remembrance of the less just and less gentle sensations of the past obliged her to admit that Jane might very naturally resolve on seeing Mrs. Cole, or any other steady friend, when she might not bear to see herself. She spoke as she felt with earnest regret and solicitude, sincerely wishing that the circumstances which she collected from Miss Bates to be now actually determined on, might be as much for Miss Fairfax's advantage and comfort as possible. It must be a severe trial to them all. She had understood it was to be delayed till Colonel Campbell's return. "'So very kind,' replied Miss Bates. "'But you are always kind.' There was no bearing such an always, and to break through her dreadful gratitude, Emma made the direct inquiry of, "'Where, may I ask, is Miss Fairfax going?' "'To a Mrs. Smallridge, charming woman, most superior, to have the charge of her three little girls, delightful children, impossible that any situation could be more replete with comfort. If we accept, perhaps, Mrs. Suckling's own family and Mrs. Bragg's, but Mrs. Smallridge is intimate with them both, and in the same neighbourhood, lives only four miles from Maple Grove. Jane will be only four miles from Maple Grove. Mrs. Elton, I suppose, has been the person to whom Miss Fairfax owes. Yes, our good Mrs. Elton, the most indefatigable true friend. She would not take denial. She would not let Jane say no, for when Jane first heard of it—it was the day before yesterday, the very morning we were at Donwell—when Jane first heard of it, she was quite decided against accepting the offer, and for the reasons you mention, exactly as you say, she had made up her mind to close with nothing till Colonel Campbell's return, and nothing should induce her to enter into any engagement at present, and so she told Mrs. Elton over and over again, and I am sure I had no more idea that she would change her mind. Mind. But that good Mrs. Elton, whose judgment never fails her, saw farther than I did. It is not everybody that would have stood out in such a kind way as she did, and refused to take Jane's answer. But she positively declared she would not write any such denial yesterday as Jane wished her. She would wait, and sure enough, yesterday evening it was all settled that Jane should go. Quite a surprise to me. I had not the least idea. Jane took Mrs. Elton aside and told her at once that upon thinking over the advantages of Mrs. Smallridge's situation, she had come to the resolution of accepting it. I did not know a word of it till it was all settled. You spent the evening with Mrs. Elton? Yes, all of us. Mrs. Elton would have us come. It was settled so upon the hill while we were walking about with Mr. Knightley. You all must spend your evening with us, said she. I positively must have you all come. Mr. Knightley was there too, was he? "'No, not Mr. Knightley. He declined it from the first, and though I thought he would come, because Mrs. Elton declared she would not let him off, he did not. But my mother and Jane and I were all there, and the very agreeable evening we had. Such kind friends, you know, Miss Woodhouse, one must always find agreeable, though everybody seemed rather fagged after the morning's party. Even pleasure, you know, is fatiguing, and I cannot say that any of them seemed very much to have enjoyed it. However, I shall always think it a very pleasant party, and feel extremely obliged to the kind friends who included me in it.' Miss Fairfax, I suppose, though you were not aware of it, had been making up her mind the whole day. I dare say she had. Whenever the time may come, it must be unwelcome to her and all her friends. But I hope her engagement will have every alleviation that is possible. I mean as to the character and manners of the family. Thank you, dear Miss Woodhouse. Yes, indeed, there is everything in the world that could make her happy in it, except the sucklings and brags. There is not such another nursery establishment so liberal and elegant in all Mrs. Elton's acquaintance. Mrs. Smallridge, a most delightful woman, a style of living almost equal to Maple Grove. And as to the children, except the little sucklings and little brags, there are not such elegant sweet children anywhere. Jane will be treated with such regard and kindness. It will be nothing but pleasure, a life of pleasure. And her salary! I really cannot venture to name her salary to you, Miss Woodhouse. Even you, used as you are to great sums, would hardly believe that so much could be given to a young person like Jane. Ah, madam, cried Emma, if other children are at all like what I remember to have been myself, I should think five times the amount of what I have ever yet heard named as a salary on such occasions dearly earned. You are so noble in your ideas. And when is Miss Fairfax to leave you? Very soon, very soon indeed. That's the worst of it. Within a fortnight. Mrs. Smallridge is in a great hurry. My poor mother does not know how to bear it. 
So then I try to pull it out of her thoughts and say, Come, ma'am, do not let us think about it any more. Her friends must all be sorry to lose her, and will not Colonel and Mrs. Campbell be sorry to find that she has engaged herself before their return? Yes, Jane says she is sure they will, but yet this is such a situation as she cannot feel herself justified in declining. I was so astonished when she first told me what she had been saying to Mrs. Elton, and Mrs. Elton at the same moment came congratulating me upon it. It was before tea. Stay, no, it could not be before tea, because we were just going to cards. And it was before tea, because I remember thinking— "'Oh, no, now I recollect, now I have it. Something happened before tea, but not that. Mr. Elton was called out of the room before tea. Old John Abdy's son wanted to speak with him. Poor old John, I have a great regard for him. He was clerk to my poor father twenty-seven years ago. And now, poor old man, he is bedridden, and very poorly with the rheumatic gout in his joints. I must go and see him to-day, and so will Jane, I am sure, if she gets out at all. And poor John's son came to talk to Mr. Elton about relief from the parish.' He is very well to do himself, you know, being head man at the Crown, ostler, and everything of that sort, but still he cannot keep his father without some help. And so, when Mr. Elton came back, he told us what John Ostler had been telling him, and then it came out about the shares having been sent to Randalls to take Mr. Frank Churchill to Richmond. That was what happened before tea. It was after tea that Jane spoke to Mrs. Elton. Miss Bates would hardly give Emma time to say how perfectly new this circumstance was to her, but as without supposing it possible that she could be ignorant of any of the particulars of Mr. Frank Churchill's going, she proceeded to give them all, it was of no consequence. What Mr. Elton had learned from the ostler on the subject, being the accumulation of the ostler's own knowledge, and the knowledge of the servants at Randall's, was that a messenger had come over from Richmond soon after the return of the party from Box Hill, which messenger, however, had been no more than was expected, and that Mr. Churchill had sent his nephew a few lines, containing, upon the whole, a tolerable account of Mrs. Churchill, and only wishing him not to delay coming back at beyond the next morning early, but that Mr. Frank Churchill, having resolved to go home directly, without waiting at all, and his horse seeming to have got a cold, Tom had been sent off immediately for the crown chaise, and the ostler had stood out and seen it pass by, the boy going a good pace, and driving very steady. There was nothing in all this either to astonish or interest, and it caught Emma's attention only as it united with the subject which already engaged her mind. The contrast between Mrs. Churchill's importance in the world and Jane Fairfax's struck her. One was everything, the other nothing and she sat musing on the difference of woman's destiny, and quite unconscious on what her eyes were fixed, till roused by Miss Bates's saying, "'I, I see what you were thinking of, the pianoforte. What is to become of that? Very true. Poor dear Jane was talking of it just now. You must go,' said she. "'You and I must part. You will have no business here. Let it stay, however,' said she. "'Give it house-room till Colonel Campbell comes back. I shall talk about it to him. He will settle for me. He will help me out of all my difficulties.' and to this day, I do believe, she knows not whether it was his present or his daughter's. Now Emma was obliged to think of the pianoforte, and the remembrance of all her former fanciful and unfair conjectures was so little pleasing, that she soon allowed herself to believe her visit had been long enough, and with a repetition of everything that she could venture to say of the good wishes which she really felt, took leave. End of chapter 8 Okay, so before we get any further into our post-chapter discussion, I wanted to read you this email from Julie in Minnesota. Great place to be. And I think that this is going to help inform the rest of the discussion today. Julie writes, I just finished listening, and this was to episode 671, so last week, and I wanted to make two points. First, the day before... Jane left the party, and yes, it was probably because Mrs. Elton was insufferable, and Frank arrives soon after. This is the, the day before Box Hill. This is the strawberry day. He specifically said that he met, quote, one of the party, unquote, who was already on the way home. That had to have been Jane. I imagine she had some sharp things to say about the situation he was putting her in. Thus, his dark mood when he showed up. I am 100% with you, Julie, yes. Then at Box Hill, he is getting back at her by flirting with Emma and says that he might have made a mistake, connecting himself to someone he knew only in a public place for a few weeks, and now that he sees her in her own home with her own people, he sees what she is really like, and he's having second thoughts. 
and Jane tells him to take a hike. She won't hold him if he's changed his mind, and that's a serious quarrel, and Frank is an ass. I think we can all agree. And yes, Julie, until until this chapter, I didn't, it's always hard when you've kind of read the book and studied the book. I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but you're right. I could have said this last week, not just reinforcing it today. So you are absolutely dead right. I agree with you. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people listening who are like, oh, thank God. Yes, Julie, right. Yes, good. The second point, it's probably so obvious you didn't feel the need to say it. Yes. But Mr. Weston's conundrum does make sense. M-A equals M-A. Emma. Emma is perfection. And yes, I think that that is exactly what is going on in Mr. Weston's head. I do think that's what's going on in Mr. Weston's head. And Julie goes on, it's silly and it is what Emma and Mrs. Weston and her Mr. Woodhouse think. And it's said lovingly. That's why Emma is pleased. Mr. Knightley is sarcastic and Mrs. Elton leaves in a huff. I agree with you. I really do. But I am wondering if some of my thinking that this conundrum just on surface level like this is coming off as me thinking that Jane Austen is showing us that while Mr. Weston is a good and lovely man, he's really not that bright because in American English, M-A is M-A. I haven't really thought about how you would pronounce the A just as a matter of course, the letter A in British pronunciation, maybe it actually does sound different. But I always thought that this was kind of forcing it a little bit, which seemed in line for me with Mr. Weston and seemed, as far as Jane Austen creating a a character, to be perfectly in keeping with him. I do, however, think that Jane Austen is playing with her audience not necessarily Mr. Weston, and not necessarily saying that he's he's an idiot for not getting this in the first place. I think this is this is Jane Austen with the whole uh, Francis Hutcheson virtue thing, the the mathematical equation for virtue, which still cracks me up. I think that that was Jane Austen having fun with readers who probably would have been familiar with Francis Hutcheson, and they would have recognized that. She was the one being smart, not Mr. Weston. If I implied that I think Mr. Weston knew about the Francis Hutchison virtue formula, I totally misspoke. That was definitely not my point. But I I do think you're right that just as a simple Emma, it's lovely, it's short, it's sweet. And it's certainly... Something that you could come up with really fast when everything is feeling awkward. So, yeah, I agree with you. The philosophy that you referenced was interesting and maybe another layer, but you said that the conundrum doesn't make sense, and I don't agree with that. And you're right. You are absolutely right. Forgive me if I misunderstood, and I'm telling you that water is wet. Okay. I had to keep reading because I love that. I am now, Julie, stealing that. Forgive me if I misunderstood, and I'm telling you that water is wet. I am going to put that at the bottom on the signature line of all of my emails forever. Thank you. So, yes, I think uh, I, I came very close to calling today's episode Frank is an ass. Because I think now, whether you've read this book or not before, you can see there is some writing on the wall. And part of that writing is there's been something going on with Frank and Jane since they met at the beach, which means that when we first see Frank, Frank has been promising to show up for a really long time. When does he finally start showing up? After Jane has moved in with her aunts. Now Frank has a real reason to show up. So this is this is also one of the reasons why I didn't want to bring this up too early is because wow is he a punk. All of his now we can go back and look at everything else and go okay all of that protestation, all of that oh I really wanted to meet my mother-in-law. Oh, I really wanted to come visit my father. Oh, I should have been here before. Oh, Highbury is uh where I my heart is. I am well, 
yes, actually, that part is true, but it's not true the way people were hearing it. Except for Jane. Jane clearly knew what was going on. They have clearly attached themselves to each other on some level, as we learn from the way Frank and Jane had their little back and forth fight with not saying what they meant, but saying exactly what they meant. And before we go any further in in talking about Frank and Jane, I did want to mention something about this particular chapter and the way that I remember it being done in film and TV adaptations. I do not know if this is correct, and I did not go back to rewatch them all because I'm going to do that when we're done before we have the final live stream. But my memory is that this moment when Emma goes to the Bateses, clearly an act of penance for her. And Austin says as much, you know, before it was a social obligation, it was just an obligation. Now it is a moral imperative that she go and she stay. She's not just there for 14 minutes. She is showing up for realsies. If I recall correctly, in at least some of the the film versions, she's either not allowed in at all, like everybody is sick, or she's allowed in similarly to how it starts at the beginning of this, where she sees Jane taking off and Miss Bates taking off as well. And the implication is, oh, they just don't even want to see you at all, sort of, even a little. And the rest of the scene is played that way as well. With the the information about Jane Fairfax being given, but mostly the impression that I was always left with was, wow, Miss Bates really can't hide her hurt from this. And I still think that's true, but I think that's too simple for such an important chapter as as this kind of follow-up. Because Jane Austen not has to get uh, across to us that Emma screwed up, Emma is recognizing that she screwed up, Emma is actually participating in this conversation way more than she usually does with Bates. And Miss Bates is not having massive running monologues. She's, she still has her moments where she, you know, towards the end, she kind of forgets the order that things come in and she has to correct herself and and try and remember. It's hard to tell if she's doing that because she's trying to come up with a cover story or if it's really, you know, she really is actually just remembering a piece of it now. But Miss Bates is definitely not on her A game when it comes to being chatty. So to me, there's no question that the vibe that I got from the movie versions is correct, but also not the whole story. Because one of the things that's happening with Emma as she's listening to what's happening to Jane Fairfax and and having just had this epiphany moment of, oh my God, why haven't we been, why haven't we be friends? We actually have a lot more together and as soon as Jane started to confide in her, like, I have had it, again, as you said, with Miss Elton, Emma's like, oh, we can, we can dish on that. That's okay. Now Emma's conversation with Miss Bates is a lot more focused and pointed, perhaps because she just has a chance to get a word in edgewise. I don't know. Probably because she doesn't have to listen to quite so much before she can get to getting a word in edgewise. But when Miss Bates talks about how sick Jane Fairfax has been and they had gone to tea after Box Hill, not nightly, but everybody else. And Miss Bates says, I cannot say that any of them seemed very much to have enjoyed it, the Box Hill trip. However, I shall always think of it a very pleasant party and feel extremely obliged to the kind friends who always included me and feel extremely obliged to the kind friends who included me in it. If I'm not mistaken, that would be Mr. Weston who included her and Knightley. But she's also, she's not lying here. And this is kind of complicated. Complicated. 
I don't think she's lying here because I think on some level, as much as Emma hurt her, she recognized that everything else that happened that day was to buoy her and kind of circle the wagons and be like, you're, you're ours. Even if Emma is not, you are ours. And whether you like Mrs. Elton and Mr. Elton or not, that was the right move for them to invite everybody over to their place after Box Hill. And and clearly nobody was thrilled about it, but everybody needed to show up for Miss Bates, which is just cool societally. I love that. It's It's just a beautiful moment. But Emma's response after hearing Jane's feeling sick, it was lousy. It was l- clearly lousy for everybody else after Box Hill. Emma now knows that Jane Fairfax has taken up the decision to not wait for the Campbells and to take a governess position, the one that was offered to her, arranged for her by Mrs. Elton. Emma's response to all of that is Miss Fairfax, I suppose though you were not aware of it, had been making up her mind the whole day. Miss Bates has a single line. I dare say she had. Okay, when was the last time we saw Miss Bates say a sentence, a single sentence about anything? I don't know if it's because she hadn't been thinking about this or if she's kind of gobsmacked that Emma is attending to the conversation and actually seems to care instead of just showing up and being social. The next chunks of their interaction, I think, are just as important. Emma says, whenever the time may come, it must be unwelcome to her and all her friends, but I hope her engagement will have every alleviation that is possible. I mean, as to the character and manners of the family. She's being very careful and she's being very precise because she knows there is no chance in any religious afterlife from any religion, there is no chance that this posting is going to be pleasant for Jane. Regardless of whether the family is nice or not, Jane is not happy about this. Jane did not want this. Jane has definitely been bullied into this. Emma has witnessed all of that. She's not trying to make the best of a bad situation. She is still walking this razor's edge of making it clear that she knows that the number of things that could possibly make this less painful are small. But she still is holding out hope. And then Miss Bates does kind of kick into high gear. Yes, thank you, dear Miss Woodhouse. Yes, indeed. There's everything in the world that can make her happy in it. And then she goes on to talk about how uh, living with And then she goes on to say, you know, it's not working for the sucklings. It's not working for the brags. And it's it's as good as you could get outside of their hosts and Maple Grove. So, you know, she's she's drunk the Kool-Aid. She is totally you're hearing Mrs. Elton's words coming out of Miss Bates mouth, which is not a huge surprise. And then her, her claim that there are not such elegant, sweet children anywhere. Yeah. okay. Jane will be treated with such regard and kindness. Exclamation point. M dash. It will be nothing but pleasure, a life of pleasure, and her salary. Oh, we talked about that before. Even you, used as you are to great sums, would hardly believe that so much could be given to a young person like Jane. Emma's response is one of my favorite things to ever come out of her mouth, ever, cried Emma. If other children are at all like what I remember myself to have been, I should think five times the amount of what I have ever yet heard named as a salary on such occasions dearly earned. This is the same thing we heard from parents during the pandemic about teachers. It's like, oh my God, you guys seriously don't get paid enough. And I know people forgot that pretty quickly, but it did happen and it's recorded and it's out there and we heard it more than once. The fact that Emma recognizes that, that she knows that much about what will mean for Jane to take this position shows a higher level of social and class awareness than I think we've seen before. Usually she's pretty able to live just in her own bubble. Clearly at some point something got through that bubble and she is understanding 
better what is actually about to happen to poor Jane Fairfax. And not and not just happening, but happening right away. She's got two weeks. She's got a fortnight. A, a fortnight before she is there and in place. So it's nothing but packing and preparation between now and, uh, and the end of that two-week period. And then Emma goes on to, again, be paying attention. I'm so sure that she must be really unhappy having to uh, leave before the Campbells are back, the Campbells and the Dixons. And Emma says, I'm, I'm sure that they will be sorry to find that she's engaged herself before their return. Miss Bates, yes, Jane is sure that they will, but yet this is such a situation as she cannot feel herself justified in declining. Well, we know that's not true. We know she tried. She really tried. Mrs. Elton is a steamroller, a very witchy with a capital B kind of steamroller. And then Miss Bates goes on, I was so astonished when she first told me what she had been saying to Mrs. Elton. No, thank you. And when Mrs. Elton, at the same moment, came congratulating me upon it. So Miss Bates has known how Jane feels. She has been declining this. She's been trying to decline it. Mrs. Elton is a steamroller, unpleasant woman. Jane has been refusing her. And then Miss Bates says, I was so astonished when she first told me what she had been saying to Mrs. Elton. Okay, I'll take the job. And when Mrs. Elton at the same moment came congratulating me upon it, again, congratulating her on losing Jane and the the comfort that the Bateses have had having Jane there. It's like, oh, congratulations, your favorite person's leaving. You can thank me later or now. And then she goes into her Miss Batesness where she's forgetting who did what when and telling us the story about uh, the ostler being bedridden with rheumatic gout and Mr. Elton having to go and help, all of that stuff. But because Miss Bates kicks back in, we get to hear about Frank. So now we know the timing. Frank gets a word from Randall's that he needs to go. Frank and Jane Fairfax have clearly had a fight. Frank takes off. Jane makes her decision. Now, whether there was any communication between the two of them before he took off that made Jane Fairfax solidify this decision kind of doesn't matter at this point. He is, again, an ass. Jane is now brokenhearted, bullied, and so miserable. And I don't think the headaches are drama. You know, there, there, were, there really wasn't much you could do for a bad headache, especially if you had migraines. You were, you were kind of screwed. And, oh God, you just, you feel for Jane. You kind of can't help it now. Even if you, like me, have a problem with her character early on in the book when she's very standoffish and, and hard to feel for and figure out, I think now we have a much clearer picture of why she was like that. Now, we we know she must have been kind of like this, very reserved forever because Emma had met her before and they never clicked before either. But now she has had a real reason to not talk slash confide in anyone because something's been going on with Frank and now apparently it's over and she really has nobody to talk to about it either because she was never able to talk to any about it in the first place. And then again, another line from slash about Emma that I just love in listening to Miss Bates ramble the story out. New paragraph, Jane Austen writes, there was nothing in all this either to astonish or interest. And it caught Emma's attention only as it united with the subject which already engaged her mind. The contrast between Mrs. Churchill's importance in the world and Jane Fairfax's. It struck her. One was everything, the other nothing. And she sat musing on the difference of women's destinies and quite unconscious on what her eyes were fixed until she was roused by Miss Bates. And then there's the conversation about the pianoforte. And according to Miss Bates, Jane Fairfax still does not know whether the present came from Mr. Campbell or his daughter. I think we all have 
an idea now that we understand more of what's been going on. If you recall back when Frank wrote, wrote off to get a haircut all of a sudden in London, making no sense at all, and then the next day the piano shows up. If you hadn't read the book before, you may have recognized that and gone, oh, that's interesting. If you have read the book before, you know that that's one of the Easter eggs that Jane Austen, that's some of the breadcrumbs that she lays for us so that we can follow the story of what's up with Fairfax and Frank. The fact that Miss Bates still doesn't know just indicates to us how good Jane has been about keeping all of the secret. And Frank has not been good. He's, he's dropped all sorts of hints. The only reason people haven't started to wonder about Frank is because of the way he's been flirting with Emma, which is also unconscionable. I mean, that's just revolting behavior. And no wonder Knightley has been unhappy with Frank being around. But I think Jane Austen gave us an unrealistic but important moment for Emma uh, earlier, and I think it was at the towards the end of volume two, when Emma decides, I'm not actually in love with him. I feel pretty good about that. I have thought about it rationally. There are none of the signs. Now we can just be friends and flirt, which isn't going to get in anybody else's way because he's not actually interested in slash devoted to any other women here, except maybe Harriet. Now, Emma is still thinking Harriet and Frank. Don't forget that. But we now have a pretty clear picture of what's going on. Emma's certainly starting to put pieces together because she's she's now putting Mrs. Campbell and Jane together in her mind as, a, as an interesting juxtaposition of worth. I think we can all agree that Jane Fairfax is worth at least a half dozen Mrs. Campbell's when it comes to just making the world a better place. So, so growth from Emma, she's not there yet. She still has other knots to untie. Like I mentioned, Harriet, the, the whole Harriet Frank thing, which is going to have to get dealt with. And, uh, and Emma's got some more apologizing to do, I think. The actions speak louder than words. She spent a lot of time at the Bateses. And I, I think it's especially important that the end of the chapter ends with her rethinking her not kind thoughts about Mr. Dixon having sent the piano to Jane Fairfax and it being a secret love affair. And her remembrance of all her former fanciful and unfair conjectures was so little pleasing that she soon allowed herself to believe her visit had been long enough. And with a repetition of everything that she could venture to say of the good wishes which she really felt, she took her leave. This is not the Emma from the first half of the book, from the first third of the book anyway. She's grown up. Our little Emma is growing up. And thank God. <laughs> but but also, good on her. You know, she she didn't, she went there contrite, but she didn't go there asking for anything except entry. She hasn't asked for forgiveness. She hasn't told them how badly she behaved. She is letting actions speak louder than words. And her actions in this chapter are really lovely. So I love this book. All right, that is it for me. I'm gonna go lie down. And, and, uh, yeah, I hope you have a great week. I hope I do too. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Have a great one. Take care. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's, it's a nice, 
hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.